Hi, and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for The Expanse Season 3, Episode 9, Intransigence. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review The Expanse, so I'll have to start with a spoiler warning for The Expanse up to Season 3, Episode 9. If you haven't seen up to this point, you may not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things may be spoiled for you. However, this video will not contain spoilers from the novel, so if you haven't read the novels, you are free from book spoilers. But I will have a spoiler section at the end of my video for those of you who have read the novels, but I will give a proper spoiler warning before doing so. So, this was not a bad episode, not by any means, but it was more of a slow-paced setup episode, setting the stage and providing some much-needed character moments, and it was a breath of fresh air that shows like this need, because it can't always go at full speed, otherwise the show will feel rushed. And it was particularly needed here in the second half of Season 3, because uh, there was a time, uh, just a couple of episodes ago, uh, which was a, a time jump just a couple episodes ago that was a bit jarring as it introduced a new story dynamic, new locations, and new characters. So it makes sense that we go more, uh, get a bit of a more slow paced episode to explore more of these new characters and new situations. And even though I wouldn't categorize this as a great episode, as far as a uh, setup character building episode goes, it does its job well, and I would in fact say it's much more interesting than some of the setup episodes of season 1 and 2. So I would say the show is improving. So let's start with Melba Co, who we learn is actually the daughter of Jules Pierre Mal and the sister of Julie Mal. I'm not sure if they mentioned her first name in this episode, but it's Clarissa. So Melba Co, of course, is just an alias. Her real name is Clarissa Mal. Uh, we get scenes with her and her team of electricians, and we're introduced to another one uh, in this episode named Soledad. Uh, she doesn't seem to be as much of an asshole as Stanny, but uh, still is more talkative. Uh, she brings up that they are offering hazard pay uh, triple overtime to anyone who chooses to stay on the ship and go into the ring. But she says that there's no way that she's going to do it because if they're ever paying you that much, that means the possibility of you dying is really high. Well, Stanny deduces that uh, Ren was on the Sun Un uh, when it exploded and... Uh, has always is very insensitive about it, and we can see how much Rin's death has affected Melba as she tells him to show some respect. Later, Stanny is watching the fake uh, recording of Holden claiming responsibility for the destruction of the Sun Un, uh, bashing him and saying, oh, he always knew that there was something off about him. And Melba is, of course, taking pure delight out of this and says, well, it makes you wonder what else he could be lying about. Like, perhaps that uh, lying about Jules Pierre Mal. <laughs> uh, to which Stanley replies, well, he's probably lying about a lot. Which, again, Melba was an absolute joy overhearing because, uh, yeah, because in the novels they go into more detail, which you can kind of infer here in the show, that uh, for Melba or Clarissa, it wasn't enough to simply kill Holden. She could have done that a lot easier with like a lot less effort. Uh, the point was to completely discredit and disgrace him in the same fashion of what uh, he did to her father and then kill him. And her plan seems to be working. However, then Soledad mentions that, well, they will find out his true intentions once the dusters uh, catch up to him, which of course actively worries Melba because she doesn't want the Martians uh, to find out the truth uh, which gives her the motivation she needs to stay on board and see this through. When Anna spots her and checks up on her again, Anna can tell that Melba isn't as troubled as she was but that's because her plan with Holden is working. In other words, She's feeling better for sinister reasons. However, when Anna asks her why she's staying on the ship to go into the ring, uh, Melba does think of her true motivations, which is basically to get revenge for her father. Uh, and that does make her troubled again, but she simply tells Anna that she's staying for the hazard pay. Well, 
Well, that shows she was paying attention during uh, Saldad's rant, at least. Of course, we know that the hazard pay has nothing to do with it. She's staying to finish the job to make sure that Holden dies in disgrace. So during these Melba scenes, we get a series of flashbacks to a party she once threw, which shows her interactions with her father and her sister. And I must say, these flashbacks were done in a very lost like fashion. The whole way they were structured sprinkled throughout the episode whenever we focused on Melba and how it like it flashed to one event and they even used the same sort of swooshing noises uh, that they uh, used a lot on Lost whenever they transitioned into a flashback scene. And the fact that the actor who plays Jules Pierre Mao uh, who was in the flashbacks, was also on Lost, also invokes uh, the image of Lost. And then there's Elizabeth Mitchell, who plays Anna, who also played Juliet on Lost, also makes me think of Lost. Uh, but regardless, I really liked these flashbacks. Uh, we didn't really get anything like this in the books, uh, where we actually uh, get to see the interactions between these characters, not to mention it was great to see Julie Mal portrayed in the show again, and we see this dynamic at uh, a party uh, that Clarissa threw for Julie to celebrate her racing career, uh, but she's nowhere to be found, and Clarissa finds her arguing with her father, as apparently she's going to announce that she's retiring from racing, and from what we know of her, it's implied it's because she wants to go to the belt to provide humanitarian aid, and Jules uh, berates her until she has had enough and denounces him as greedy and corrupt, and that she can't stand to be a part of his life anymore. Uh, Jules counters that he gave her everything, but she replies that she doesn't want it. Now, I have heard the opinion that Julie was acting a bit stuck up here as she was provided this very rich and lavish lifestyle while billions on Earth squander on basic and that does, uh, and that she's being, uh, you know, taking it for granted. And that does seem to be Julie's uh, perspective, but I would argue that Julie is totally right about Jules being corrupt. As we later learn, he participates in the death of hundreds of thousands of Belters and his action almost got Earth destroyed. So I actually completely side with Julie here as she's rather, she'd rather be poor and live in squander than be a part of this corruption anymore, which I think speaks a lot to the strength of her character. Clarissa, on the other hand, isn't nearly as noble as her sister and can't see things past the point of her uh, her point of view. As from her perspective, uh, Julie gets all the attention and all of her father's love. As even after Julie denounced and degraded him, Jules still admires her more and pretty much dismisses Clarissa as useless. So Clarissa goes out to confront Julie and expresses her anger at her for ruining her party and pretty much ruining everything she does. Uh, she puts all the blame uh, for, the, for the shitty way in which her father treats her onto Julie and calls her a narcissist. But Julie, rather than fighting back, simply says nothing that uh, she ever does will be good enough for their father. And it does appear that she's very much right. However, when we go back to present times, we learned that uh, isn't the message that Clarissa got as she uses Ren's pad to record a message for her father, telling him she will finally earn his respect in a way that Julie never would or could by getting revenge on the man who ruined his life. So we see this isn't simply about getting back at Holden for what he did to her father, but also about trying to prove herself in her father's eyes and prove that she's better than her sister. So now let me go over to Anna's storyline where we get another brief cameo from Ava Sorella where we see a message of her ordering all the civilians to return to Titan as they are ordering the UN fleet into the ring, which is a mission too dangerous for civilians. So we see Anna, uh, you know, talking to Dr. Reverend Hank Cortez about how big of a shame it is that they have to leave the mission now. Uh, and... 
Uh, now, the introduction of Cortez happened rather quickly in the previous episode, but he is basically the leader of a religious representation on board the Thomas Prince, and it's basically a high profile public figure who's the head of several mega churches. In the previous episode we see him giving a sanctimonious speech about the importance of the ring so he's definitely the type of person who likes to listen to the sound of his own voice. Here he tries to console Anna that at least the company on Titan will be good. But Anna's friend who we saw her talking to in the previous episode who is a wealthy billionaire named Tilly Fagan uh, she however in that she will not be returning uh, to Titan with the other civilians. Later, Anna coyly tries to get Tilly to clarify whether she's returning to Titan or not, and I love how Tilly reflects this by insinuating Anna is flirting with her, which uh, goes over Anna's head, being the innocent person of faith that she is. Overall, it was I really enjoyed the chemistry between these two characters and thought it really worked. At any rate, um, Tilly does admit that she is indeed staying on the ship as she was able to extort the first officer who wants a job at her mother's company. So Anna asks her to arrange for her to stay as well. Which she does, and apparently she does even more than that and arranges for Reverend Cortez to stay. But when Anna goes to tell him the good news, he doesn't seem too happy about it. In fact, she grabs him uh, when he's in line and is ready to board the ship to leave and he explains to her that he doesn't want to stay and that he takes back what he said before about God being out there with the ring. And while they are talking, military men come and grab a man in line saying that he's out of uniform and they threaten to charge him with desertion. But he still refuses to go, says, you know, he doesn't want to stay on the ship. He's saying that whatever is in the ring is not what he signed up for, but they tase him and remove him by force. Cortez then gets on the ship and leaves. So basically, Cortez is just as frightened as the ensign that tried to sneak away, and that all of his bluster about oh, how they were chosen was just BS. In fact, Cortez kind of hints at the ring being a very dark place, uh, but Anna seems convinced it is a miracle. I think it just goes to show that Cortez is just a fraud, and Anna is the real deal, but we'll see. So anyway, let's move over to the Bohemoth, uh, which begins with them dealing with the aftermath of trying to destroy the Rosinate, which of course Dami isn't at all happy about, and is trying to find out if they survived, but Ashford reminds her that she is the chief engineer and should be working on repairing the ship. I do like how her first reaction is to reject Ashford and say, well, that's, uh, I don't work for you, I don't work for dolls, but Drummer points out that she was the one who gave the order to fire so Naomi does get back to work but isn't happy about it. So I like the different reactions that Drummer and Ashford had over the fact that the ship malfunctioned when they tried to launch a torpedo where Drummer laughs hysterically over it and, but Ashford simply said what we got is what we get. So he seems to have a more easygoing roll with it attitude and is all about working with what they have, something that is probably commonplace to Belters. This is also shown in a later scene when he talks to Naomi and she mentions that the behemoth wasn't built to be a battleship and he again says it's, the not right, it's not the right tool for the job but it's the one we have. So I like that about him. That does make him a bit more practical and it shows that he's not one to dwell over things that he can't control. And also in the, uh, that conversation, he expresses to Naomi that he's glad that the Rosinate survived, which she finds hard to believe because he was the one who suggested to destroy the Rosinate in the first place. And she insists that Holden is innocent and is being framed, to which Astrid says that he believes her, uh, to which she replies, well, that makes it even worse that he's willing to kill someone he knows is innocent. But he retorts that... It's what was needed. Uh, it's what needed to be done to save the behemoth and save their people. And I actually agree with him. I think he's being totally reasonable. But I can see Naomi's perspective as well. And it shows how connected she still is to the Rosnate crew. 
But in any event, Ashford also talks about how the Martians went through the ring and sent a message telling everyone to just sit on their hands while they catch the Rosinate, which of course wouldn't sit right with the Belters. So they've decided to go into the ring anyway. And then we get this rousing speech from Drummer when she addresses the whole ship and talks about how it's the Belter's right to explore what is out there and they are more fit than the Inners as it's uh, spaceborne and it's uh, the outer reaches of the system and just gives a rousing speech about how the Belter's don't feel fear. Uh, and um, during her speech, Ashford starts banging on the railing, which turns into stomping, which turns into chest pounding, which turns into, yeah, to like, so it's like a rhythmic uh, show of support that all of the Belters are in solidarity with their captain and her inspirational speech. And I have to say, I actually love this scene. I thought it perfectly encapsulated the Belter spirit and shows how after years of petty squabbling and splinter groups, how they are seeing the benefit of coming together for the greater good of the belt and this to me is most exemplified in the fact that Ashford was the one who was leading the beat and after her speech calls for cheers as Ashford represents uh, Dawes's group where Drummer represents Fred Johnson's group who were both bitter rivals but it shows that Ashford is willing to follow Drummer's lead and support her wholeheartedly for the good of the belt so I thought that was a great scene. However, we later see Naomi intending to leave to go back to the Rosinante and Drummer confronts her as she feels uh, a bit abandoned by her. But Naomi explains that uh, she needs to return to the Rosinante and that she's realizing that she never should have left in the first place and says that she, she was feeling nostalgic, which is why she returned to the uh, OPA. And it's funny because this was a callback to what Ashford had said to her earlier, but he was saying it in regards to the Rosnate, and he said that following the feelings of nostalgia never works. However, funny thing is, is that she took that in the opposite direction and followed his advice, but felt that the nostalgia was about returning to the OPA in the first place, as she's realizing that her rightful place is on the Rosnate. And this exchange between her and Drummer was really powerful as well, as Drummer also shows how much she's grown to respect her and shows how powerful their relationship has become as when Naomi assumes that Drummer would just try to stop her from leaving, Drummer simply opens the door to let her leave and says, you underestimate me, which is a really touching moment and again shows how much these two have grown to appreciate each other. So I do hope to, uh, that we get to see the, uh, more of this pairing later on. At any rate, we see Naomi heading back to the Rosinante and trying to communicate with them to tell them that she's on her way, but they don't respond. We, of course, know this is because the comms are damaged and they can't receive uh, transmissions. Uh, so, but uh, Naomi is not disheartened and continues to make her way back to them. Now, we also know that Naomi is much needed as the Rosinante has been sabotaged and Amos and Alex don't have the know-how to repair the ship. In fact, Alex said they would need to uh, in order to do proper repairs, they'd have to go to a space dock. But if anyone can fix uh, the ship out there, it's Naomi. So, uh, my, I'm really hoping that she can get to them before the Martians do. And uh, the Martians do have a head start on her, but uh, maybe the Rosnate will turn and move towards her, perhaps to realizing uh, that it's Naomi, or at the very least know that having contact with the Belters would be better than surrendering to the Martians. Either way, uh, I really hope to see Naomi uh, reunited on the Rosnate. Anyway, speaking of the verse, now Taylor let's finally move over to that storyline. So we begin here with the crew trying to figure out what happened after they entered the ring and the torpedo chasing them appears to freeze in midair. But Alex explains that the torpedo is still moving, but very slowly, but also has changed course and is floating towards the center of the bubble that they are now in, where there appears to be a strange sphere 
uh, some refer to as the nucleus in the center of this bubble. However, uh, why hold, while Holden, Amos, and Alex talk to try to figure out what to do, it comes out that Holden is seeing Miller, to which Monica Stewart questions, and that dissolves into speculation about uh, who or what Miller is. And I absolutely love what Alex does next, as he silences them all and says, well, this is a great conversation to have once they're safely out of the ring. And that's actually a great point and speaks a lot to Alex's character as weird space orbs and ghosts appearing are secondary concerns to him as his main concern is the here and now and practical problems right in front of them. At any rate, as they talk about uh, what their main problems are, they need, uh, they said that their biggest problem is to Holden talks about how their biggest problem is to find out how the ship was sabotaged and to repair it. And I love that while he's talking, Amos sort of starts to peek over and glare at the camera that's filming him and then something starts to click. And so I knew he was just going to smash that camera as it was so natural for Amos. He then grabs Ilio, the cameraman, and threatens him. Monica insists that they don't know anything, but Ilio confesses to putting something in the ship, uh, but he insists it was only supposed to give them a backdoor into more, to so give them more information about the comms and that so they could use them in their documentary. And the thing is, I do believe him. He said that he uh, got it from a connection, one whom he never met. So I think it's obvious that connection was Clarissa Mal and that she used that to disable the Rosnate and send out this false message. So I believe Elio that he had no idea uh, what it would actually do and that Clarissa sold it to him as a simple way to gather information but really used it to sabotage them. And the reason why I believe Elio had no idea what it would really do is because, as he even points out, that he would have died with them. And I don't see this character as suicidal, so uh, I think he was just being used. At any rate, Holden goes and locks himself in the room to try to get Miller to talk to him uh, with no results. Uh, we do get a funny little scene of Alex going down to check on Holden who just glares at him and then shuts the door. I suppose that scene was okay. It shows the awkwardness around this situation, but overall, I didn't really care that much for this scene uh, or find it that funny, but that's just me. So, while Holden was busy brooding in his room, Amos was having his way with the documentarian. Uh, and by having his way, I mean threatening to kill them. Uh, something Holden would probably keep him in check had he been there, but he was absent. Uh, of course, as soon as Alex sees him, uh, he tries to stop him, but by then it's a bit too late. After Amos had already put what looks like a screwdriver to Monica Stewart's throat, he gathers both of the documentarians and prepares to throw them out of an airlock. However, when Alex shows up, Amos specifies that he's allowing them to get into spacesuits. So he's not killing them, but he's still basically throwing them off the ship. The plan is that they will get picked up the, by the Martians so they can tell the Martians what really happened on the Rosinate. But as Alex later points out, the way it was mistreated them makes the possibility that they would actually put in a good word for them very low. And it was very funny seeing uh, Amos's reaction to this, which was like, what? I was gentle. Classic Amos. At any rate, uh, when Mars came into the ring to chase them, they started shooting probes to test the area, and by getting a probe to gradually speed up, they were able to determine a speed limit within the bubble uh, that is the fastest speed that they can go before they are grabbed by this force. As Alex puts it, it's as if something, if something goes too fast, something gets nervous and grabs it. And so uh, the Martian ship starts going towards the Rosnate at the top speed allowed. And the Rosnate matches the speed to stop them from catching them. Uh, so we get this super slow chase scene. But uh, other probes uh, that the Martians sent out showed that they vanished as soon as they hit the bubble. So that leaves them with uh, little options. Either keep going and risk hitting the edge and also disappearing, or slow down and let the Martians catch them. 
Holden eventually decides to slow down and to be caught as he points out this is their only option, even though it means that even if they can convince the Martians that they're not responsible for sun, the Sun Un, uh, they will still definitely take the Rosnate away from them. A prospect Alex isn't particularly thrilled about, but Holden points out that it's better than death. But when they slow down, Miller finally appears to Holden and complains about why they're slowing down. And it's like, come on, let's go, let's get to the crime scene. And Holden, of course, is like, ah, now you finally decide to show up. And then yells at Miller to drop this stupid detective metaphors and says that he wants to know everything that Miller knows. So then Miller starts spouting out a bunch of technical and scientific jargon. He mentions a non-local quantum quantum hologram, which sounds like an interesting concept to me. It kind of implies that this version of Miller is just a projection of some kind. But of course, this was a funny scene, as after he spouts out all these technical terms uh, that was obviously went way over Holden's head, he simply says, uh, so you were saying, crime scene? <laughs> I must admit that was funny. However, uh, this time Miller is a lot more coherent than he was in his previous appearances and is able to hold coherent conversations with Holden. Holden even points out uh, this uh, that there seems to be something different about him and he explains that the signal is much better in here, which again implies he's a projection coming from the protomolecule. He then talks about uh, going to the nucleus in the center of the bubble and Holden seems totally on board with this but apparently is unwilling to risk the safety of the crew as instead of flying the Rosinate to the center he elects to get into a spacesuit, climbs on top of the Rosinate and jumps towards the nucleus. Now this is kind of the trait I see in a lot of hero characters and it kind of annoys me. Uh, not in a storytelling sense as I still think uh, this is great storytelling but has uh, a characteristic uh, that is this misguided attempt to protect his crew from risk. He goes on a dangerous mission alone uh, where I think it would have been better for him to trust his crewmates but that's typical Holden, am I right? <laughs> so my rating for Intransigence out of 10 is an 8 extremely good. As I said, a very strong character building episode that had a lot of great moments from expanding Melba's character through a series of fascinating and well-designed flashbacks to getting the dynamic of Holden and the crew dealing with their current predicament to the new United OPA on the behemoth, as well as exploring the fascinating new concepts like the bubble within the ring and the speed limit that apparently exists there. This episode is a cog in the machine to be sure, but a very interesting one, and it does its job well. So that's it for my spoiler-free section of my review of Intransigence. I have already done a live discussion video with Avkin Tomko and Darren from D's Reviews on this episode. You can check that out uh, the, in the replay in the archives. I'll put a link to that video in the description below. You can also check out my channel for many more Expanse videos as well as uh, other videos on other shows like Star Trek, Game of Thrones, Babylon 5, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching. But for those of you who have read the novels, you can follow me to my spoiler section, which begins now. So, Reverend Father Dr. Hank Cortez is leaving. Say it ain't so. I'm hoping that they'll find a way to bring him back into the story and into the ring, but I really don't see how. Uh, they show him boarding a ship to go to Titan, and he seems adamant that he needs to go. And I must say, if he is indeed leaving uh, to never be heard of again... I don't really see why they even bothered to include him in the first place. I mean, I suppose it could be a brief cameo to, like, appease book fans, but he was barely even in it, so why even bother? I know it made for a nice little scene to show that he was a bit of a fraud and that his attitude about the ring and his statements about God not being uh, out there with them reflect his attitude in the books, which is kind of what makes me think they will find a way to bring him back so they can keep his storyline. Because the thing is, if he is indeed gone, 
this would seem to indicate that they are going to streamline the whole mutiny on board the Behemoth storyline, which he was a major part of, which I certainly hope they do not do, as that was a very important part of the of the book. In fact, the whole sending civilians away thing seems to go against what happened in the novels, uh, even if it does make imperial sense. Uh, has there were a lot of civilians on board the behemoth. So this does have me worried that they will rush through the second half of the book, and if they do indeed try to finish book three in the mere four episodes we have left, I honestly don't see how they can do it without it feeling incredibly rushed. Now, I know a lot of people have been speculating that Ashford won't go the way he did in the novels and will follow more bull storyline and will be more of the hero, the good guy, but I don't think that will happen. And more importantly, I don't want that to happen, as I think that would change, uh, that change would likely ruin the entire story. As Ashford's mutiny is a major part of the events in the ring, it shows how freaked out humans can be when confronted with the unknown and how sometimes their instincts are to try to blindly eliminate what they don't know uh, because they're afraid. And plus, with, uh, with Ashford in the show... Uh, even though they're showing a lot of good qualities in him, and I, I have already folded a lot of character traits from Bull into Ashford, he still underliningly comes across as a villain. And I personally think all these great qualities are just a way to have him be a dynamic villain rather than a two-dimensional mustache-twirling villain, something that The Expanse is really good at. Also... It will make uh, the turn into a villain more of a blow to audiences who have grown to like this character. And as I said, even in the novels, you get Ashford's motivations and how he thinks he's just doing what's best for humanity. And I think they could very, very do the, they could do the same thing here in the show very well. So I do hope uh, they keep the storyline with the fleet being damaged and everyone, including uh, Martians and Earthers, having to board the Behemoth. But I don't see how they could get through uh, all of that, including having Holden go to the station and also including wrapping up Calurse's storyline with her going to the Rosnate and Anna following her there. All of this in four episodes without it feeling incredibly rushed. As much as I would like them to be able to start season four with book four, I'm actually kind of hoping they save some of the book three stuff uh, till next season. But the showrunner's statement that season three would not end on a cliffhanger and would be a good stopping point as me thinking perhaps otherwise. But we'll see. Anyway, that's all I have for spoilers, so I'll see you all next week.